Hello, welcome back to my series, The Decades of Action Challenge, inspired by the epic film challenge uh, that's been done by uh, Forkerball and Razorwire Reviews on their YouTube channels. Um, they have been um, going through a book called 1001 Movies You Must See Before You Die, uh, watching the various entries, making videos about them. I am doing a similar series, but my source is a series of essays that are being published on avclub.com called A History of Violence. They're written by Tom Brehan, and it is about basically what Brehan considers the most important action movie of each year, starting with Bullet, starring Steve McQueen in 1968 and moving forward to the present day. This year I'm doing 1992. I, this episode I'm doing 1992. Um, no, sorry, 89, sorry, I got ahead of myself there. Uh, last week I did Die Hard, 88. Uh, I, I'm a little, conf uh, it's a little bit confusing for me because the movie that I'm talking about, The Killer, didn't reach Chicago theaters where I live until 1991. Um, but it's officially an 89 movie, that's when it first came out. It's a Hong Kong film, directed, of course, by John Woo. Um, he had made a couple of action movies prior to this called A Better Tomorrow and A Better Tomorrow Part 2 that starred Chow Yun-Fat, uh, who you know from Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, and the third Pirates of the Caribbean movie, as well as other action movies like The Replacement Killers and Bulletproof Monk. Um, he, uh, you know, and John Woo buddied up, basically, and made a, a few films together, uh, the killer being the one that really got them a lot of attention stateside, in addition to John, uh, uh, um, Chow Yun-Fat getting work in American films, John Woo, of course, uh, eventually, uh, came over here, uh, to direct the, uh, 1993, um, Jean-Claude Van Damme action movie called Hard Target, and then he went on to do Broken Arrow and Face Off with John Travolta, he did Mission Impossible 2, he did Winter Talkers with Nicolas Cage, uh, and his last American movie was Paycheck uh, with Ben Affleck and Uma Thurman, which didn't do all that well, so he's, you know, back in his home country now making uh, movies. I think that uh, the first movie that he did once he returned was called Red Cliff starring Jet Li, but I haven't seen the movie, so if I've gotten the star of that movie wrong, I apologize. The Killer, as I said, um, came to American cinemas in 1991. Um, and um, at that time, I was a senior in high school, and uh, a few friends of mine and I would often uh, drive into the city. We lived in the suburbs. We'd drive into the city to a theater called The Music Box in Chicago. That was an art house theater that played films that no one else was showing because uh, they were foreign films, art films, you know, kind of indie films mostly, you know, rather than the wide release movies. And in the lead up to the summer, we saw the preview the trailer for this movie, The Killer, several times in front of the movies we went to see, and we went nuts over it. I had read about this movie briefly in an article about um, movies that didn't get the R rating, they got NC-17 or X, because they were too violent, too sexy, and all the description that they had for this movie was, it has dozens of shootouts, and so it couldn't get an R rating, you know, it was just too violent. I'm like, okay, fine, lots of shootouts. And then we saw the preview for it, and we were just, our minds were just blown by this thing, you know. John Woo's style wasn't a thing back then. It's not like nobody ever used slow motion, but nobody ever used slow motion in this way, where you have basically, instead of, the best way for me to describe it is, you have basically medium shots and wide shots, uh, and then you cut to close-up shots. But instead of doing that, John Woo mostly cuts between regular speed and slow motion and back again in an almost seemingly arbitrary way. But it works just beautifully for a movie like this. Um, I don't know what kind of inspiration he got to do this kind of thing, um, but this was something that he started doing in his Better Tomorrow movies, especially the climax of Better Tomorrow Part II, um, in which there was, you know, <coughs> a big... Uh, a couple of guys, uh, you know, leaped a, uh, leap a fence uh, to invade this house to take out some bad guys, and they have, you know, a very similar kind of thing. If you've ever seen the movie True Romance uh, that Tony Scott directed, um, uh, at one point, um, Patricia Arquette's actually watching the climax from A Better Tomorrow Part Two uh, on a TV in a scene. Um, but the killer basically has spread throughout the entire movie, beginning, middle, and end all throughout, these scenes whereby you have characters pulling out guns and shooting, but the, uh, the, the, the slow motion seems kind of arbitrary where it's placed, but it just works fantastically well. Um, and that's just one reason why this movie works so well. Let me tell you a little bit about the story. Um, Chow Yun-Fat, 
this is the main character. He is a contract killer who oftentimes works for organized crime um, through this um, uh, a friend of his who's a mob associate, or Yakuza associate, I guess. or That's Japanese. I'm, I'm not sure what they call the uh, organized crime in, in China exactly. Um, but he is given a job, basically, to take out this, uh, this mob boss uh, by one of his underlings so that the underling can take control. Um, and so he does this, but then he gets screwed over on the payment, and uh, in the um, the new bomb boss wants to take him out instead. But uh, Cha Yun Fat's character is very, very difficult to kill. <laughs> but in the opening scene of the movie, one of the opening sequences of the movie, he takes out another guy at a contract. But in the process of shooting the place up and taking out all his henchmen and then taking out the guy, he accidentally blinds uh, an innocent bystander, singer, a woman named Jenny. Um, they, uh, they, they have Chinese names in this movie, but her Chinese name sounds so much like the word Jenny that the subtitles just call her Jenny. Uh, uh, the, um, the, actually, the uh, version of this that I just rewatched is a DVD called The Dragon Dynasty. Um, I got Hard Boiled too, which is uh, a movie that he made after this. It's also part of the series, and I'll be reviewing that in about three weeks. Um, but the subtitles aren't the same as they were from the original American release of the movie. The nicknames are different. Uh, in the American release, um, Chow Yun-Fat has this sort of uh, rivalry with a cop that's trying to take him down. Um, and they have these nicknames for each other, Mickey Mouse and Dumbo, uh, which lead to some funny conversations. But they're, 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 they call each other different names in this version, as far as the subtitles go. And also a lot of the dialogue is different. Some of the music is actually slightly different. Um, there's a cue that actually cuts off to dead silence right before gunfight begins in the beginning of the movie. And in this version, they actually let the music continue right until the, uh, the bullets start flying. So that's a little different. I wish I you know could rewatch the version that I originally saw, because that's my favorite, of course. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I took what I could get. Um, and uh, so anyway, when he blinds the singer, when the contract killer blinds the singer, uh, he wants to make up for it. So he befriends her um, and then he uh, seeks to get another contract with a really high payday so they can pay for her eye surgery. She needs to get her corneas replaced um, because they're just going to deteriorate more and more and eventually she's going to be completely blind. <clears throat> so, um, this whole business of him taking this job, this uh, last job, and the one that he is not getting paid for, but they're trying to kill him instead, is the one that he really needs the payday for, for her. Um, he's got some principles. Hmm. Excuse me, my throat's still a little itchy, <clears throat> scratchy. Um, and, uh, and this is demonstrated later on in the movie, which um, he... Uh, uh, there's another innocent bystander, a little girl who gets hurt during a gunshot, dur during a shootout. So he packs her up in his car and drives her to a hospital, makes sure that the doctors get her breathing again before he makes his escape, even though he's got, you know, cops tracking him down and everything. Um, the principal cop in this movie, Danny Lee, is uh, one who was very intent on, on taking him out. It was his job to protect uh, the guy who got killed, um, that Chow Yun-Fat killed, and so he's really intent uh, on... And get, taking this guy out, but uh, he's always um, sort of gets a little bit too emotionally involved. That's a common theme in this movie, um, uh, the theme of getting too emotionally involved in your work. Um, whereas, you know, a lot of people are telling both of these guys, both the killer and the cop, you know, don't, you know, get involved emotionally. Don't let, you know, your passion run away with you. Just focus on the job, remain uh, emotionally removed, just get it done. And these guys, they just can't do it. They've got, you know, uh, they have their own personal sense of justice that they need to satisfy, uh, in addition to just following the rules of their profession, whatever they may be. There's also a lot of talk about honor, of course, um, what it means to be a man versus a dog, that kind of thing. Um, all the characters have these, uh, m m most of the, uh, the principal characters have these little, little uh, uh, sort of personal goals that they set for themselves, or at least these standards to which they want to uphold as far as, you know, even the criminals, they have, they have you know, lines they won't cross, at least some of them will. The really, really bad criminals, they don't have any lines. They'll, they'll, they'll do anything, and so they're seen as, you know, the bad guys, even though the main character as a contract killer is responsible for, you know, dozens of people getting killed throughout the movie. Um, and uh, probably, you know, the best moment in the whole film is when um, the, uh, 
uh, killer and the cop, they acknowledge their mutual admiration for each other. You know, they, they realize they have a lot in common. And so when the big set piece comes, when the gangster basically hires more killers to converge on the house that they're both at, they're both standing side by side shooting at uh, all the bad guys together, which is great. It's a real, like, kind of stand up and cheer moment. Uh, and these gunfights are just incredible. You've got people jumping and leaping, flying through the air. You've got, you know, guys, you know, firing two guns everywhere you go. This is like a big thing. Now, it didn't happen as much in, in action movies, whereas now it kind of happens all the time. Um, uh, and, and the music and, and just the slow motion, the things blowing up every which way. Uh, the climax takes place in a church. And it's funny, now that I'm watching this on a, a bigger TV, it actually, the, the church this itself looks smaller <laughs> than I remember it. I don't know really why that is. Um, but it just, you know, the whole floor plan seems a little bit more contained. So it's like these guys are standing in the middle of the place. Their clothes are bloody. They each got a couple of uh, 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 wounds to the arm or leg or what have you. But they're still pulling out guns and grenades and shotguns and just blasting everything in sight around them, trying to protect this, this one woman uh, who's just caught up in the middle of it and can't even see where she's going. Um, it, it's really something. It's, it's a really, really amazing movie. And a lot of people consider Hard Boiled um, John Woo's masterpiece, um, including Brehan, because uh, he wrote about it, obviously, for his column. He says so specifically. It's like, you know, this is his masterpiece. Um, but although the characters may be more fully rounded, in Hard Boiled, I feel Hard Boiled is just a little bit too excessive as far as uh, all the all the destruction and mayhem goes. There is a point in which the action and the destruction and, and, and the violence just gets a little bit too much. Um, uh, last week, I, I finally sat down and watched the fourth Transformers movies. I skipped seeing it in the theater, but it was on TV. It just happened to be on, so I'm like, okay, I'll take a look at it. And the closing sequence, which also happens to take place in China, by the way, um, just goes on and on and on, and there's just an incredible amount of destruction. Uh, you know, Hard Boil doesn't even come close to that, except that there's just, you know, no blood in the Transformers movies. Um, but, uh, yeah, Hard Boil is just one that just kind of, like, really, really pummels you with all the, uh, with all the, uh, 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 people getting killed and shot up at the end. Um, whereas the killer seems a little bit more restrained by comparison, and therefore it's more enjoyable to me. Um, yeah, uh, it, uh, it's a fun movie. Obviously, I consider it sort of a 1991 movie personally, um, and it made my top ten list of that year, along with a few other <laughs> really good movies. Um, but yeah, it was quite, quite, quite exciting, quite invigorating. The only real drawback with this movie is that as more people got to see it, they sort of started treating it like a comedy. And um, the last time I remember, last time we went to see it uh, in the theater, because it played for uh, quite a while, the music box, <clears throat> or it played on a number of occasions, People just seem to, you know, not want to take any of it seriously. And this is a very sort of hard-on-its-sleeve type movie. Um, and although some of the translations as far as the subtitles go can be quite funny, um, yeah, it, it got to be, you know, everyone was just reacting a little bit too comically to it. Um, so that sort of spoiled things slightly. But, you know, I mean, in all the years since then, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to match. It's really hard to beat. Um, I've enjoyed a few of John Woo's American movies. Most notably, Face Off, which also made Brehan's list, so I'll be reviewing that one a little bit later. Um, but uh, most of what he's done in America hasn't come close to doing The Killer, or Hard Boiled either, for that matter. They've been uh, maybe a little bit too silly, or maybe taking themselves a little bit too seriously. Something just was off about it. Um... Anyway, um, that's, uh, that's really all I have to say on this movie right here. Um, if you're a fan of John Woo, if you've seen his American movies, you really owe it to yourself to check out The Killer. Um, if you can find it, it's, it's, it's well worth watching. You will not be disappointed by the action of this because it's, it's really, really great. Um, and Hard Boiled's probably, you know, right up your alley as well. Um, so, yeah, it's, it, it's essential. And um, I, I, uh, I wonder why Hard Boiled made the list, actually. Um, but, you know, obviously, Brie had his great imagination, uh, 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 great, great admiration for it. So I'll reread his uh, article um, after I rewatch the movie. Uh, so, yeah, The Killer. That's all I got to say on The Killer. Thanks very much for watching. Um, next week, of course, is 1990. That will be Arnold Schwarzenegger in Total Recall, directed by Paul Verhoeven. Uh, I'll have that one up on time, promise. And um, uh, the playlist for all the videos that I've made on this series is linked below, as is my Facebook page if you'd like to stop by there. Thanks very much for watching. I'll see you again next time. Take it easy.